are viewing assistance in therapy animals in human care facilities, benefits versus risks. Pause for thoughts by Dr. Ronald Varner from the Department of Family Medicine. Let's begin with a little bit of prehistory. This is a clay piece used in Mesopotamia to try and help them understand what was causing disease in the rural agricultural farming population. If we can think of the plains on a sunny spring or summer day, years ago, the Native Americans learned to hunt bison before the introduction of the horse by emulating animal behavior so that they would get close enough for their arrows to find their mark. To continue, there are probably 60% or greater of households in the United States that have at least one pet animal. There are lots of cats, 88.3 million, and approximately 74.8 million dogs. Of course, you probably understand that homes that have cats are likely to have multiple animals, whereas homes with dogs are likely to have single animals. And then there are smaller animals, such as rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, gerbils, birds, and fish. Dr. Bustad said, The forces that connect people with animals are very strong and enduring. Dr. Bustad is a co-founder of Delta Society. Some of you may already be familiar with Delta Society. We will return to this topic at the end of the presentation. Another aspect, among 500 people in hospitals, nursing, and residential homes, when they were asked what do they miss most, it is their pet, and a lot of us can relate to that. In fact, pet owners, the vast majority, consider their pet a member of the family. So, humans are predisposed to human attachments, especially children. And of course, animals exhibit a lot of childlike behaviors. They're very unassuming, no double standards, and affectionate. Sable has said that attachment to another human or an animal is vital for our well-being. So looking at some early history where animals were used in therapy with humans, we find that this dates back some time, in fact, the early 9th century AD. In the 9th century, animals were introduced to handicapped persons to try to help them cope and try to have better outcomes with their daily circumstances. In the 1790s, in a place known as the York Retreat, an asylum in England, Physical restraints were replaced with love, trust, kindness, and animals in some circumstances. These were British Quakers who allowed farm animals to interact with mentally ill patients. They were attempting to avoid some of the very unpleasant psychiatric interventions of the day because they felt these were not efficacious. In the 1800s in Germany, therapy animals were introduced in homes for epileptics and also in World War II as therapy animals. They were used in convalescent hospitals. A word about terminology. The literature is quite rich in discussing animals and human assistance. One term, animal assisted activity. This refers to when animals are brought in periodically but do not reside in the facility. Now, animal-assisted therapy is a term that began to enter the literature in the early 1960s, and this refers to animals that co-reside with human patients in long-term care, rehabilitation, and other community care facilities, such as group homes. The animals most frequently used since the early 60s are dogs, cats, pocket pets, such as rabbits and guinea pigs, and also aquariums and birds. Another term is human-animal bond. This term entered the literature in the late 1960s and early 1970s and continues to be a frequent topic at professional or scientific meetings. It not only refers to animals in long-term care or another facility, but in a much broader sense. As a side note, in the late 1960s, many vets were indoctrinated that the only justification for veterinary medicine was the promotion of human health. Whether that be to help the dairy farmer curb high rates of mastitis or high rates of neonatal calf mortality so that he or she could be a more efficient producer of milk, or making sure that a pet animal of some child does not have a zoonotic disease. 
So here are some familiar scenes of many facilities today. This young lady is cuddling a rabbit. Here is an older woman, possibly in hospice. Here is a young man in some type of facility or acute care setting. Here is a child. Here is an older gentleman now in a wheelchair with his best friend. And then here is another child possibly suffering from cancer. These scenes are repeated many times across the United States, Canada, Australia, and Western Europe. And the literature will tell you that this is a trend that is also being seen in South Asia and other parts of the world. So, what is it from the physiological basis that seems to underpin these beneficial encounters, such as significant decreases in systolic and diastolic blood pressure after petting a dog in patients who felt a bond with that animal? Let's talk about the benefits of animal assistance or animal therapy or just plain pet therapy. The terms are starting to coalesce into animal assisted interventions. Of a side note, most terms go through an evolution of sorts. It causes us some headache when researching literature. Let's get back to the benefits of pet therapy. You can probably think of many on your own. Broadly speaking, animals provide companionship. They also facilitate exercise. There is a lot of literature today noting the obesity epidemic in humans. Well, guess what? There is an obesity epidemic in animals as well. Animals are something to take care of. They provide a sense of responsibility, security, and comfort, and they are non-judgmental. Various people have looked at lots of outcomes. Just to note, this area of research is not an easy one. It provides challenge in trying to describe the matrix, making sure outcomes are identified as precisely as possible. And you will see a lot of terminology that overlaps. Nevertheless, animals are our friends. Animals are used to improve social interaction and confidence. Fields et al. and others noted a greater number of interactions occurred when a puppy was present as opposed to a plant, a bottle of wine, or no object at all. They also noted that repetitive statements and various levels of hostility either ceased or decreased. Again, as noted before, due to difficulty with research, one won't find many systematic reviews or meta-analyses of these kinds of studies because it is difficult to assemble studies that are like enough to give you confidence. Friedman et al. and Reed noticed that in relationship to myocardial infarction and pet ownership, if someone suffered an MI and had a pet as opposed to someone who didn't own a pet, they had a greater one-year survival rate. And again, in long-term care, pets reduce the feelings of loneliness. So what do you think are the possible risks that are unique to animal assistance therapy? We'll give you a second here. Yes, disease is one of those. Any others? Accidental trauma from slips and falls. Allergies. Anything else? Well, very good. Those are definitely risks. Allergies, bites and scratches, accidents. People can slip and fall or get tangled in a leash. And of course, zoonotic infections. Zoonotic infections are those that can be naturally transmitted between animals and humans, or vice versa, humans and animals. These occur rarely. In an example, a recent consult about strep in a child and strep laryngitis in the family dog. That does occur. No one is ready to quite yet say that strep is a one-way transmission. It is most likely a transmission that occurs both ways. In that example, the advice would be that animals that have a nasal drainage that is positive for strep, and it's the same type of strep that is in the child, it is best to treat the child and the family pet simultaneously and this usually stops the transmission. Either way, it occurred. All right, allergies. Cats are more of a risk for allergies than guinea pigs, horses, then dogs, and then birds. We know that animal dander, hair, saliva, and other excretions can certainly be allergens for humans. 
The symptoms of animal-induced allergies are usually nocturnal wheezing and coughing, asthma, allergic rhinitis, and conjunctivitis. However, in a study by board-certified allergists in North America, only about 6% of their patients were truly allergic to animals. Let's talk about prevention now. So how would we prevent allergies in long-term care facilities? First, you need to have some knowledge of the history of your patient. Second, you need to choose the correct animal. And third, it is strongly recommended that the visiting animal or the resident animal be groomed on a regular basis to reduce the amount of dander and hair shedding. As a side note, if you have a choice between a short-haired animal and a long-haired animal, the best choice would be the short-haired. Moving on to injury, when we think of injury in these settings, we usually think about bites and certainly dogs are more likely to bite than a cat. Scratches, on the other hand, are more likely a cat problem. The primary concern would be that older humans tend to have much thinner skin and we would be concerned about bacterial infections. Prevention in this case would include carefully choosing the breed and the temperament of the animal, training of the animal and the handler, and three, getting the pet certified. There are several groups uh, available that uh, provide certification of therapy dogs. One of those groups is called Therapy Dogs International. Um, I will have that website available at the end of the presentation. Temperament testing is key to any animal that is involved in animal-assisted interventions. Education of the patient and staff and a suggestion for cats introduced into long-term care facilities would be to have the cat declawed, but just the front paws. There are many people who object to declawing cats. However, if you declaw early, and the animal is deeply anesthetized. It is a painless procedure for the cat. However, the cat will have some pain and need to rest for a few days. But after that, and if they receive pain medication, they will heal up just fine. It is not recommended to do both the front and the rear claws. This would put the cat at risk. If it were to escape, it would not be able to defend itself outside. On to our next area. Here we are primarily concerned with slips and falls. How do we prevent slips and falls? Again, training and certification of the animal and the handler. Planning by the staff or whatever venues will be interacting with the patients and education of the handler and nursing staff. Of note, before an animal comes into a facility, it should be allowed to eliminate or void so that there is less chance of accidents. This goes back to temperament and we want to avoid marking behaviors and submissive urination. Zoonotic infection. Depending on what list you read, there are probably about 150 to 200 known diseases that are transmitted naturally between animals and humans. Why is that list arranged? Well, in some cases, people would put tetanus in that list. I do not consider it to be an infection, but more of an environmental contaminant. Although we have those spores in our feces, as well as many animals do, it is something that I do not consider transmitted uniquely between animals and humans. The major ones that I would be concerned about would be scabies mites, fleas, gram-positive and negative, bacterial species including MRSA, Cryptosporidia, Giardia, Coxicella, also Q fever, ringworm, and psittacosis. And let's not forget about different strains of influenza A which could be transmitted by bird. Having said that, zoonotic diseases are very rarely diagnosed among nursing home or extended care residents. In our area, in the last 18 years, it has been our experience that zoonotic disease is rarely diagnosed in a typical family practice setting. Most of these diseases have a rather very complicated life cycle and fairly host-specific and really require fairly extended contact in an animal intense environment before any type of transmission can occur. In fact, in our region, Great Plains, a resident is more likely to contract West Nile virus from mosquitoes, especially if water puddles aren't uh, kept drained around a facility. Having said that, how do we prevent these types of disease transmissions? The first and foremost thing is adequate and frequent hand washing. That is the number one recommended method. 
Limit the animal species. Choose and screen the animal. We certainly do not want turtles, amphibians, or boa constrictors in long-term care resident settings. A lot of these creatures carry salmonella, and they don't groom themselves very well. Again, the short-haired variety pet is uh, more preferred. Recommend that the animals have very um, adequate veterinary care and supervision. These programs that train dogs insist that the animals are vaccinated against all diseases that we can vaccinate against, that they have specific disease screening from time to time, such as for heartworms and intestinal roundworms, and treat those problems if necessary. And in between, regular health exams. And one more time, hand washing. These guidelines have served us well in one year in a study conducted of 284 nursing homes, for every 100,000 person hours of exposure, there was one pet-related incident and 500 non-pet-related incidents. So, according to this study, you are far more likely to be infected by another human than by an animal. This brings us to discuss quickly what is the current consensus, if you will, about evidence on what a good animal assistance intervention could, should contain? All of them are evidence-based, screened by a very large committee with deep interest in the subject area. The first is to require good ha hand hygiene programs for all participants, patients, visitors, and health care workers. Again, this is not just the patients, but also the visitors. Number two, in the health care facility, there needs to be specific program policies. Patient-owned animals, patient-owned animal policies may differ from policies for volunteer-owned animals. In other words, if a patient wants to bring his or her own animal, this policy may differ from volunteer-owned animals. Number three, determine suitability of animals or animal by species, breed, age, and origin. Dogs are the most common, but not all breeds of dogs or ages of dogs or air origin may be appropriate. Exclude non-human primates, reptiles, amphibians, and rodents. Deny any entry of an animal directly from an animal shelter or a pound. Shelter animals have not had the time to thoroughly be screened for disease and may not be the best behavioral candidate. The next item, determine the suitability of the animal's temperament. How are they going to react to sudden noises or strangers, for example? An older gentleman may be trying to pet an animal but he may be impacted by stroke. The animal may not react well to a real restraining hug or clumsy padding. On to number five. A good animal-assisted intervention should have animals that have regular health screenings and routine veterinary medical care or surgical care. Our next item is dietary health. No raw meat. Some people may think it's more healthy or organic for the dog. Well, it provides a real easy way to transmit salmonella and other gram negatives to the animal's GI tract. Number seven, a good program has training and management of animal handlers on a regular basis. The next item is adequate preparation of animals before each visit. Manage contact between the animals and people during visits. Obtain consent from patients and or their family members. Restrict animals from entering food prep areas, medication prep areas, or areas of invasive human treatment such as IV infusion or dialysis. Number 10 is contact tracing procedure. Now this doesn't mean you have to call the FBI in. What this means is that you ought to have a sign-in log that the animal handler can fill out or record the areas and room numbers that the animal has visited. Next, you should determine visit locations in conjunction with infection control. Finally, have established cleaning schedules. Even in facilities without animals, there are established cleaning schedules, but you may want to beef those up somewhat. All of this information comes from an article in the American Journal of Infection Control, 2008. Here are some of the internet sources, and if you need this PowerPoint, please go to www.ttuhsc.edu backslash Amarillo backslash SOM backslash IM calendar GEC. 
Thank you for participating in this web training.